Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. Philomena Trindade, an internationally renowned teacher, author, and lecturer on anti-aging and integrative medicine. With a master's in public health, Dr. Trindade graduated first in her class in family practice from the UC Davis School of Medicine and has been in clinical practice for over 18 years. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Trindade. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. So let's go back to your earlier years and what initially inspired you to go study medicine? Um, well, I immigrated to this country at the age of 11. I actually turned 11 on the way. And for some reason, even though I didn't speak English at the time and I was initially uh, working really hard to learn, I always found myself translating for patients in a medical setting. Um, and so that, that sort of intrigued me. And then um, I had decided that um, sort of the only way to pick myself up from my bootstraps and do something with my life was education, that that was sort of the way to survive. And um, I, so I had sort of planned a few things, like what can I do, what, um, how can I put this to you so I know I'm kind of good in the medical field and I have an interest there, you know, is that an area that I can go? But I never thought about medicine in terms of being a doctor. I thought, oh, I could be a medical assistant, you know, I could help people that way, that sort of thing. So then when I was in, by the way, my parents moved around a lot. We were farm workers. And I ended up living with my aunt for three years so I could go to the same high school. And uh, while I was in high school, my best friend at the time, uh, we started talking about, what, what do you want to do? And she says, well, I want to be a pediatrician. And, I, and so I started thinking, hmm, okay, well, I want to be a medical assistant. If she can think she can be a pediatrician, maybe I can too. So then I started saying, okay, well, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm not sure if a pediatrician is what I want, but I think I could do this. And so my plan was, what if I don't make it? So I thought, my plan's going to be, I'll go as far as it will take me. And once I fail, then that's sort of the universe telling me, that's where you're supposed to stay, and I'll be happy with that. That was my goal. So then in medical school, I mean in um, high school, when it came time to apply, I had a counselor that was really not interested in you unless you were a jock, and I was not a jock. I was more into my books and really trying to learn. And um, so I looked for someone, and I found this other counselor who allowed me to go into his office and ask him questions and stuff. And so I, he told me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, my friend Rosa wants to be a pediatrician, and I've been interested in you know the health field. So... Um, I was thinking maybe a medical assistant or something. He goes, well, why not be like your friend? Why not say you're going to be a doctor? And I said, okay. So he helped me fill out the application. And then we decided, well, where do you want to go? And I, and I said, well, where can I go? And he says, well, you have grades to apply to a UC campus. And by then my parents had settled in Watsonville, California, which is right next to UC Santa Cruz, one of the UCs. And I said, I really need to stay close to home there's a lot of things I need to help my family with, so let's pick one close to home, and that was UC Santa Cruz. And so we're looking through the catalog, and he's like, oh, they don't have a pre-med program, but they have a biology. Should we put down biology? And I said, sure. So <laughs> that's how I became a biology major. And then it turned out that UC Santa Cruz actually had a sort of a pre-med program in their biology major, and there was quite a few of us that were pre-med. And so we had a little group, and we kind of hung out and supported each other. And then when I was done, when I finished my um, undergraduate education, I actually took a next year because I did some research. I uh, wasn't really sure because all my friends are applying and they've gone into medical school. And I was like, you know, I think this is what I want, but is it really? So I decided to do public health. And I got a master's in public health first. And I love public health. And I'm really glad that I did it because it gave me a totally different understanding about research and what gets published and how to interpret you know, the, the articles that we read. Uh, but I decided I really missed that one-on-one, -on -one and I thought I w really did want medicine. So then I went to medical school and uh, went to UC Davis, which was great because I got a real primary um, medicine focus. And um, there's one thing I forgot to say here that really sort of pushed this along the way, um, and that is while I was in medical school, 
I had, you know, I, I translated for quite a few different people. But at one point, my um, best friend, the one that said she wanted to be a pediatrician, Rosa. yeah, exactly. She was translating for someone, and she took me with her. And it ended up being that she was translating for this little boy who was three years old and had um, a brain tumor. That really, really affected me. Even to this day, I still remember walking into his house, and he's like with his head on the floor, you know, just crying. And there was really a lot of problems with translation and them not understanding the family and the family not being able to convey to the doctor what was going on. And it was really a horrible experience, but it's what motivated me. I think if I hadn't had that, I probably would have said, oh, I can do something else in the medical field. But that really um, showed me how, you know, having sort of a, a cultural background in that area or just being sensitive to cultural differences can make such a big impact on someone's life and make a difference in their care, too. So that was a really big deal in terms of me sticking it out and saying, yeah, okay, I, I, can do, I think I can do this. So you graduated from UC Davis, mm -hmm. and then? And then um, I did my residency at UC San Francisco, uh, Santa Rosa, the Santa Rosa program, which is uh, very much, uh, it's a family practice program, and very much focused on sort of you working in a rural area, or at least um, learning all the things that you would need. So for example, we do surgical assisting, we learned some, we learned some surgical skills, we learned how to do C-sections, and that was really good for me because I wanted to go back home which is Watsonville area, that's what I consider home in this country. Um, and I wanted to be able to have all those skills, even if I wasn't going to use them, so to say, speak. So that was, I, I feel like I got the best training, really. So what was the catalyst for you to transition into a functional family practitioner? Mm, very good question. So I really went into medicine because I thought I would learn how to reverse disease how to treat it properly, how to get to the underlying root cause, and make a difference in someone's life. But you didn't learn that in medical school. No, I did not. And I've always had sort of this holistic approach in my own mind and how I see medicine and how I was raised in terms of, you know, using herbs and using, you know, a lot of different modalities, you know, for health. Um, I was really frustrated in medical school and residency. Um, I think residency, it was more just survival. And so the frustration was more on, you know, how can I get enough rest to think clearly because I'm dealing with people's lives. Whereas in medical school, it was like, why do I need to learn all this basic science and then I'm not going to turn around and use it? You know, why? This doesn't make any sense. And why so heavy on the pharmaceutical and nothing else? And even though, you know, I think Davis is pretty um, innovative and kind of um, out there in terms of incorporating a little bit of nutrition and and your medical school education, it's still left, you know, a lot sort of by the wayside. I mean, I remember doing an acting internship in the ICU because at one point I had thought about doing ICU medicine just because I did well in that area. And so a lot of my teachers were sort of encouraging me, encouraging me to, to pursue it. And I was lucky enough to have one of my mentors be an MD, PhD, and his PhD was in nutrition. And he would make us order magnesium and zinc and all our ICU patients. Now back then, it would take two weeks for us to get the results back. So they would go home before you got the results. But I just remember having to do the follow-up and having to call them and they were all low. And so I was like, this is more what I want. You know, this is kind of what I want to do. But then survival sets in, right? And you just kind of have to get through it. So after I finished, I um, went to work in my hometown. So I was working with farm workers, which is what I wanted to do, and that was, great in that aspect, but I felt like I didn't have the skills to really prevent some of the diseases I was seeing, or at least to arrest its progression. All I was really taught was how to use pharmaceuticals, and I knew there was another way. So I quickly became frustrated and burned out, and I burned out really early on. You know, I was uh, a medical director of a nonprofit, and I was in our, in our clinic was going bankrupt, so at the time I was both executive director and medical director, and still seeing patients. So it was, I mean, it was crazy, and I know that that contributed to the burnout, but really the main reason why I burned out was because I just was not happy. And I felt like I'm not doing my patients the service that I wanted to do them, and I don't have the tools, so how do I gain those tools? Because I can read as much as possible on my own, and I did, but that, I still felt like I didn't have a method. You know, it's like I didn't have a protocol or a way to figure out, well, how do I integrate the things that I'm learning, and how do I then turn around and put it into clinical practice. 
So I was searching and I was really questioning whether or not I was going to stay in medicine. It was a really difficult time in my life, actually. So, you couldn't go back to your guidance counselor. Yeah, yeah, no, not then. So um, I've always lived by to thy own self be true, That's sort of one of my major motives. So I decided, okay, well, I have $200,000 in loan. Let me pay back my loans, and after that, I can leave medicine. You know, I just be free to do what makes you happy. And if that means leaving, then by all means do it. And I remember telling some of my friends that, and they just thought I was crazy. They're like, you know, what else can you do? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but I'm willing to find out because I'm not happy. And I know that I can be of service in another way. So that was sort of my goal. And I enrolled in some of the re loan repayment programs where I, could, I was working in a nonprofit and that would help me get my loan sort of off my back so then I was free to make my own choices. And right around that time, I, because um, I was looking for all these conferences, right, and all these um, sort of uh, programs where I could learn some of the nutrition I had learned and some of the biochemistry. And then I was really looking for a method, you know, like a, a, a method that I could then incorporate some of the things I was learning. Well, that's when I met Dr. Smith. And there was at a university um, compounding um, meeting. And I remember talking to her, and there was a, like, as I was talking to her and telling her how frustrated I was, other people came up, and they were all women. And they're like, yeah, this is a major issue, and, you know, what do we do? And I just remember her saying, stick with me. I'm getting together this fellowship. It's going to happen. Just stick out with me. You know, hang out. You know, don't despair. And sure enough, she did. And then I just fell back in love with medicine all, all over again. I was like, this is it. This is what I needed because I have the tools now and it's just a matter of me learning and going and doing this step by step. And I was lucky enough that by the time that I started the fellowship, I had gotten out of my um, debt. nonprofit. Either I'm not in my debt, exactly. Yeah, that was first, first and foremost. And then I was no longer the medical director of the nonprofit. So I actually left and then I worked part time. And so I was able to start my own practice and start implementing the things I was learning because I think that was key for me. And it's one thing that I see in a lot of our fellows now, they're not necessarily doing that. They're learning and thinking, well, I'm going to apply this in the future when I'm ready. What was the first thing that you did to implement it into your practice? Uh, the first things that I learned to do? First thing, yeah. Uh, actually, it was hormones, uh, predominantly adrenal. So I started... Learn, I learned about the problems with the adrenal dysfunction and the adrenal glands, and I started implementing that right away because it made so much sense, and gut. So it was the two areas that I started implementing, and I'm like, okay, and now I'm, I think I know a little bit about adrenals. What next? So then that led me to looking at all the hormones, looking at the thyroid and the sex hormones, and really trying to figure out how does this symphony, you know, as Dr. Smith puts it, how does it all fit together, and then how do I address that with what's going on with my patients? And and, and what are the root causes of it? Because many times, yeah, patients may present for hormones because they've heard something about it or their friends on them, but then you have to assess each person individually and you have to figure out, well, you have high blood pressure. We need to figure out why you develop high, high blood pressure because that's not normal and that has to do with insulin, I know, somehow. And then how does that fit into the big picture? So it just kept leading me into other things and it's been great ever since. And how many years has it been? Uh, let's see, um, I went out on my own in 2003 and did the fellowship, I think it was 2004 when I first started. So 13 years, wow. So how would you say your personal life has been impacted? 